about King Josiah's reformation and how they were doing renovations in the temple and they found, hidden up in the attic somewhere, the Book of the Covenant. And they realized then that they had turned their backs on God. We learned last week that it is important to keep God first and to always remember his word. Today, we have prepared a sermon to preach from 2 Chronicles chapter 34, and we call it the first purge. The first purge. The first purge. Let's pray. Gracious God, in the blessed name of Jesus, we thank you for the songs of the gospel. God, we thank you that the Holy Word has been read. And Lord, we thank you that we have already offered the prayers of thanksgiving and prayers of mercy to your holy name. Now, my Lord, it's preaching time. Yeah. Your people, my God, have come together and gathered in your name that they might hear a word from you. Speak, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The story goes that in the eighth year of King Josiah, when he was about 16 years of age, he began to seek the Lord God of David, his father. And he began to seek him for himself. And he then began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from all of the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. This part of Josiah's reformation was a purging and eradication of cleansing of all the idol worship and the actions, the attitudes, and the behaviors that often cause people to turn their backs on God. You see, when Josiah began to seek the Lord for himself, it became abundantly clear that there were some things in his own life that needed to go. When Josiah began to seek the Lord God for himself, it became clear that there were some things up with living life in this rat race and the need to keep up with what society expects from us. We end up then trying to please people, trying to please places, and even trying to please things. We end up then worshiping people, places, and things. And it causes us to turn our backs on God. But when we seek after God, when we commit to learning his word, and when we commit to living his word, and commit to dedicating our lives to serving him, we learn then how to purge from ourselves and how to purge from our lives those things that often cause us to stray from God's word. You see, that's exactly what Josiah did. When he sought God for himself, he began to purge all of the High places. High places. Are those places in the Old Testament that were built for the worship of false gods? The belief that you had to go physically higher in order to worship God. Like the erection of the Tower of Babel or the building of altars on mountains. Like, just like today, some people are so convinced that they got to go to a mega church. That small is somehow of less value or of less important. Yeah. So they got to go where everybody else is. They got to go to a cathedral. They got to go to an arena because they think that bigger is better. I don't know what God they worship, but the God that I serve says where two or three are gathered in my name, there shall I be in the midst of them. When two or three are gathered in my name, there shall I be in the midst of them. It don't matter if you got 3,000. It don't matter if you got 300. It don't matter if you got but three. If God ain't in the midst, you ain't not giving God praise. If God ain't in the midst, it's because you did not come to worship 
the Lord. Oh, I don't want y'all to get me wrong. We all need to be concerned about church growth. And by church growth, I mean the making of more disciples. Not the building up of a church membership role full of names of church folk. You heard? Not a, a large role of people's names that you can put go around and say, we got 500 members on roll. How many saved souls do you got in your church? How many saved souls are there in the body of Jesus Christ? It ain't about the members on the roll. It's about those who come to praise God. Society is so concerned about size and not concerned enough about quality. We have made high places our gods. Don't concern yourself so much with the size of your church as you concern yourself with the quality of your church. Even, in, even with your faith, it's about the quality of your faith. Jesus says even the faith the size of a mustard seed is enough faith to move a mountain. Even the, the faith the size of a mustard seed is enough to get you through everything when people think you want to grow in the top. Even the faith the size of a mustard seed is enough to bless you to do those things that God has called you to do. We don't need a bigger church. We just need to remember that we are the church. The church ain't these four walls in this city. The church is not this building. The church is we, the people. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. So we don't come to church. We come to worship. We don't come to have some church. We come to give God some prayer. We come to bless the name of the Lord. We come because God is good and still in the blessing business. And when you give him the praise, it don't matter if you got three or if you got 3,000. When you're giving God the praise, the mountains and all the heaven have to stop and say, let people are praising God for real. When you're giving God the praise, it don't matter who's on your left. It don't matter who's on your right. It don't matter where you're being. It don't matter where you're going. But the blessings of the Lord are coming down because the praises of God is going up when you're giving God praise. It don't matter the size of your church. You could be sitting in a arena that ain't nothing but a dead church because the love of God ain't in their heart. And they don't even know how to speak to somebody who walks into the door. You got to purge ourselves from the mentality that bigger is somehow better. That's what Josiah did. He purged from Judah the high places and the groves. The groves. That's where they worshiped the gods of fortune and faith. That believe that if you worship these gods, you would somehow then receive material blessings from these gods. And because you receive blessings from these gods, that would make you happy. Yes, there are so many stories in our Bibles that teach us to the contrary. Material things ain't going to make you happy. Jesus says, it is easier for a camel to enter the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. As the rich man died, he was tortured and burning in hell as the poor man Lazarus was comfortably resting in the bosom of Abraham. The Bible teaches us about Nabal, a rich fool who when he died, all of his possessions and his wife became David's possessions and David's wife. There's another rich fool who built more barns and he built bigger barns so that he could store all of his stuff. And Jesus called him a fool and said, This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose things shall these be that you have provided for yourself? Too many people think that if they get more stuff, if they get bigger cars, 
if they get bigger houses, if they get a better job, that somehow if they get a better man, if they get a better wife, they somehow think that these things on the outside are going to make them more happy. But God is trying to tell us today that if you are truly happy, you don't need more stuff. If you are truly happy, your car ain't going to make you. You make the car. You should see me riding around in my daddy's hoop. People look at me. They shake their head. They see the way I'm dressed. When I step out of that hoopty, and, and, and one guy said, one of these things are not like the other. He said, one of these things just doesn't belong. And he looked at me, and he said, do you remember that? I said, yeah, I remember that, but I don't evidence that. I evidence that I'm blessed no matter what I'm driving. I'm blessed no matter what I'm wearing. I'm blessed no matter where I'm going. I'm blessed because the blood of Jesus Christ is what washed my soul. The word of Jesus Christ is what enlightens my heart. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that's got me blessed. And that makes me happy. And you know the Bible uses a, a different word for happy. The biblical translation of the word happy is blessed. Your blessedness does, is not tied to your pocketbook. Your blessedness is not tied to your pocketbook. Your blessedness is not tied to your possessions. Your blessedness is not tied to fame or fortune. That's why a man like Jacob, all alone, running for his life, afraid that his brother is going to try to kill him, a man like that can have an encounter with God and declare, I ain't gonna let you go till you bless me. I ain't gonna let you go till you bless me. I ain't gonna let you go till you know I thank you. I ain't gonna let you go until I praise your name. Lord, I ain't gonna let you go until you bless me. That's how Jacob can walk away with a limp and walk away with a new name. Oh, I'm trying to tell you, he walked away with a new walk. He walked away with a new tongue. He walked away with the Holy Ghost. He walked away declaring, I am blessed. I am blessed because he walks with me. I am blessed because he talks with me. I am blessed because he strives with me. I am blessed because the Lord fights my every battle and the Lord tells me that I am gold. He said his blessedness was not tied to fame or fortune. That's how a, a poor left can cry out to Jesus Christ from the side of the road. He cried out, Lord, have mercy upon us. And Jesus gave them all the word to go and show himself. Jesus gave them all the word that gave them hope. Jesus gave them all the word that cleansed their mind, their body, and their soul. Jesus gave them all the word, a word that one of them decided to follow. And the poor leper comes back to give thanks to Jesus Christ. The poor leper comes back to give the Lord the praise and he comes back to say I am blessed. I am blessed because Jesus saw me. He says I am blessed because he heard my cry. I am blessed because the Lord answered my prayer. I am blessed because he saved my soul. My blessing is not tied to my possession. It explains how a poor virgin visited by the Holy Ghost who tells her thou hast found favor with God. Mm -hmm. Said the Lord God is with you. That's how she can then, even though she's still poor, she can then proclaim, I am blessed and highly favored. She said, from henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. She said, they can't say that I'm rich, but they can say that I'm blessed. They can't say that I've got all these possessions, but they're going to have to say that I am blessed. They're going to say I'm blessed because I've got the favor of God. I'm blessed because the Lord God is with me. I'm blessed because I am filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. She knew that her blessedness was not tied to possession. So why? God asked 
asked this question in Isaiah. He says, why do we spend so much money for things that don't provide nourishment? Why do we spend so much money on a vehicle that loses value the moment you take it off the lot? Why do we spend so much money at the weed shop? Why do we spend so much money to buy exotic goods? Why do we spend so much money that don't give us nourishment, he said. Yes. Why do we work so hard for things that don't even satisfy us. As soon as we get them, we got to get something else. Why do we work so hard for things that we cannot take with us? He's trying to tell us we need to be working hard for the things that satisfy our soul. We need to be working hard for the things that we can use even in the afterlife. The old folks used to say, when you see me praying, I'm building me a home. And I ain't building me a home on earth. I'm building me a home in heaven. When you see me praising God, I'm building me a home. When you see me visiting the sick, I'm building me a home. When you see me loving people who curse me, I'm building me a home. Because one day, this old building is going to leave. One day, this old body is going to break down. One day, my soul is going to have to have a place to stay. So I'm building me a home. God says, why don't you just listen to my word? He says, why don't you just hear my word and you shall have what is good. Hear my word and your soul shall be satisfied. Oh, I gotta tell you, I love it when the choir sings something that I feel already in the, in the sermon. I love it when I open up the response to reading and I see a scripture that was not even on my mind, but gives me confirmation that this is God's word and not a word from Reverend Thomas. The word says today that God blesses those who diligently seek him. You want a bigger house? Diligently seek the Lord. You want a better car? Diligently seek the Lord. You want a better man? Diligently seek the Lord. You want, because if you want a better man, you diligently seek the Lord. Because if you diligently seek the Lord, that's going to make you a better woman. If you diligently seek the Lord, that's going to make you a better man. And when you become better, you're going to attract better. When you become better, you're going to get better. When you Which was right. 
to know what's right. All you need is a mind, and all you need is a heart. When you know what's right in the eyes of God, God sees your holiness. God sees your righteousness. It's right to seek Him. And when you seek the Lord, the Lord takes you, the Lord picks you up, He makes you that city that is set upon the hill. He makes you the light to give light to those who are still lost in darkness. But nobody takes a light and put it underneath the bed. But people take that light and they put it up high. So it gives light to everything in the house. You got to learn to let your light show. You got to learn to let your light shine. You got to learn to let it shine by seeking Jesus. Let it shine by offering your testimony. Let it shine by praising God. Let it shine by being kind to one another. Let it shine. And the Lord God will bless you.